Um, we have a full agenda of business this morning, so we'll keep it going. Item one is Cedric and Apologies. Rona. Uh, thank you, Leader. We have apologies uh, from uh, the Deputy Leader, and at the start of the meeting, uh, Councillor Marshall's not present yet. Uh, could I submit uh, Sean Marshall's apologies, please? Thank you. Okay, moving on up to declarations of interest. Do any members have a declaration of interest? No. Uh, moving on to item three, which is a minute meeting the 14th of January 2016. This is up for approval. I'm happy to move it. Happy to second. Okay, if we move on to item four, which is the Council of Revenue Budget monitoring for the period ending 31st of December 2015. The report gives members an overview of the Council's revenue budget and forecast financial performance for the year to 31st of March 2016. It also provides a forecast of year-end general fund balances and funding available to support investment and required savings through the change fund. I'm pleased to note that while remaining a significant challenge, the Council is forecast to contain expenditure within budget by the end of financial year and all appropriate measures are being taken to ensure this remains the case. Paul's here to answer any questions arising from the report. Members? Ivor? Chair, it's just with regard to the change fund. I know this is the 31st of December's report, but I was just wondering if we were any closer to the 7 to 7.5 million we require and if we aren't, um, has that been taken into consideration within the savings for next year's budget to make sure that we have enough to cover our uh, change expenditure? Yep. We've made good progress since the last time we reported to committee. In January, it was 5.3 million. We've added another £600,000. Since then, and we'll continue to look for further opportunities between now and the end of the year. There's still some uh, resources held corporately at this stage, which are reflected at Appendix 1 to the report, and there may be opportunities to lose some of those at the end of the year. So we'll come back to the members as part of the year-end report to say you know, the extent to which those have been utilised. And I expect to be able to get you know, close to and hopefully reach the full £7.5 million target by the 31st of March. Do we require the seven and a half, or would seven be sufficient? Because it, there is that seven or seven and a half. It's very much an estimate at this stage, and it's, it's a high-level estimate. And re really, we've been using about three million pounds a year to date to deliver savings of roughly eight million pounds a year. So really, it's just a factor in up to we've got twenty-one million pounds to save next year. How much we'll need to invest in that will depend partly on the savings measures that members agree next Monday, and then how that thing progress beyond that. So it's very much an estimate at this stage. The figure will be between seven and a half million pounds. I think that's something we'll further monitor. Colin? Presumably the, the, the exact requirement of the change fund will depend on what budgets members actually set, because a large part of the change fund is obviously the payment of redundancies, and how many redundancies will occur will depend which budget um, is agreed on Monday. Uh, can we go to the recommendations? Can we note one and two? Move on to item six. Oh, sorry. I said I was going to get it finished quickly. <laughs> Move on to item five, which is the Chief Executive Service Revenue Monitoring Report. This report gives members an overview of the financial performance of the Chief Executive Service for 2015-16. I'm pleased to note that the projected position for the service and the continued support of staff with clear direction from senior officers will deliver a balanced budget. Lorna is here uh, to deal with any questions arising from the report. Members? Ivor? Chair, just similar to the last one, we are another two months down from when this report came out, are we closer to the 28,000 measures to be identified or is that uh, still 
Gustavo, ahorita todo. And it, uh, thanks, Leader. Um, refer to 3.1.2. Um, just a suggestion. I know some directors do this, but could we reduce the number of um, seminars and briefings out with the days and actually hold them in the days that committees are? At least it might be a small amount. At least it would help. Yep. Okay, if we move to the recommendations, can we know one, two, three, and four? Okay, now number six. Capital Investment Strategy Monitoring 2015-16. This report gives members information on the progress so far in the Council's uh, Capital Investment Strategy for the current financial year. As at the end of December, the Council has, has spent nearly £19 million pounds of the £30 million pounds programme. This continues to be an important part of our contribution to support our local economy and delivering projects which are integral to our Council priorities. The overall funding of the investment strategy and the progress of the approved uh, programmes within the strategy are reflected in this report, while more detailed information on agreed projects within the approved programmes are reflected within the individual asset class reports. The report also provides members with an annual monitoring update on criteria under which the capital projects should be referred to committee for scrutiny and slippage, which is also incorporated within the appendices of the report. Paul uh, is here to answer any queries arising from the report. Jane. Um, thank you very much indeed. I've been asked, um, Leader, to raise the issue on page 48 of the play areas and playing fields at Pau Foot. Um, I, I understand um, that the local member uh, concerned was not advised that this was happening um, and uh, there are affected households to do with that play area. The request is that um, we actually... Um, advise and consult um, those households around the area before we actually do make the environment, if that was all right. So all that I'm asking for is a delay in that environment until that, that work is done. I don't know if that please could be done. Oh, I'm not aware of the detail on the particular project, but happy to feed that information back to the, the appropriate lead officer. And see if that can be taken forward. Okay, Ian. Same point, Leader. I mean, I think it's, there's two members from that ward in here as well, actually, part, as part of this. And I've looked at this, considered it myself, and I actually believe the information to be uh, inaccurate. And I think for, lo for those reasons, again, within paragraph 2.4 in particular, for those reasons, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, we should delay that because it's asking us for to rule this, uh, this uh, proposal out of hand. The figures contained within it. All members were invited to, to a meeting at site at, at, at Powell Foot to look in regards to that. There was a, quite a simple solution to this. You know, clearly, it hasn't been addressed or looked at. And I think it should be advised that we should maybe go back to that, have a revisited. But to, to say that it refers to a river where the Powell Burn's actually the, the nearest outlet. It's, isn't there a river anywhere near there? It's the Powell Burn or the, or the, the Solway Firth. So just the, it's, the inaccuracy, yeah. it's, it's the inaccuracies, maybe it's might be a bit closer, but there is inaccuracies within this report. What, what is the inaccuracies you're talking about? It, well, how, it, refer, it refers to the nearest outfall being a river, and it's actually the Powell Burn, and it's, it's not that far away. It is a water course. Other than that, I mean, and it's the actual, it's the 600... So how's this six, affecting? How, I, don't, I don't understand your, your point. Well, what's, what's being asked for, if you, if you read the report leader, what's being asked for in that, in that particular paragraph is to rule this out of hand and not, not consider it. Come back to the point that was being made by Councillor Brodie through Councillor Maitland, was saying that this should be deferred, because that, that information within it, and it refers to £685,000 to actually bring this to compliance. Don't believe that for a minute. The, the, that figure is a wrong figure. But, um, oh, do you want to come in? 
Uh, you're absolutely right, it is a burn, not a river. Uh, apologies for that. It is 69.5 thousand, not 695 thousand pounds for the drainage scheme. And yeah, we'll happily consult with uh, communities on options for that uh, project. Colin? My reading of the report is actually to de delay this anyway till the next financial year. Um, it's, it, that's what the report's saying, so I'm not entirely sure why somebody's asking for deferring something that's actually being deferred anyway. I mean, it seems to my reading of the report is that they'll investigate options and it'll have to be taken care of in the next financial year. I mean, we're in February now. Um, we either spend the money in the financial year or we don't spend the money, but I, it sounds to me as if there isn't a solution that can be spent in this current financial year. Therefore, we're not, I, I'm not sure what members are asking to actually happen, to defer something when actually that's what the report says, basically, to, look to the next financial year to deal with the problem. Ronnie. Chair, just, as this meeting has been recorded, uh, Councillor Crothers stated that all members were invited to a meeting at Fall Foot. I certainly wasn't invited to a meeting at Fall Foot, so just to clear the record there. Jane, uh, I, I, I'm knowing nothing more about it other than <laughs> reporting, reporting and requesting. I mean, what, what, if, if I was to read this as an absolute ignorant member of the public, I would say that this project was actually being bombed out and the money was being vied to another project. That, that's all that no, I take from that. It's been, it's been <laughs> delayed. That's what I couldn't understand. I couldn't well, get well, that's absolutely fine. It's just not how I read that. Um, and, uh, and, and as long as we are making no decision about that money at this point for it to go to another, um, another project, then I see, well, no, I see no problem. Later, the proposal would be that, that the uh, budget for 1516 would be used for the John Bell playing field, but that the, the works at Powfoot would clearly be addressed uh, early in the next financial year. But uh, the complexity of the work is such that it certainly can't be done uh, during the remainder of this year. Oh, that was my understanding. So you're actually just uh, bringing up money for a project that can't be fulfilled this year, as we've done in all other cases, and then we're looking at the, the complexities, the rising complexities within the, this project. The point. Yeah. It just it went when I read in the paragraph 2.4, no secure outfall has been identified to support this drainage project. Therefore, this project is unable to proceed. I took it that that was it being mothballed, put in a back burner. Therefore, if we're agreeing that we're actually putting this into the next financial year, got no qualms with, 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 with that whatsoever. That's how I read it, Leader. Well, it's, it's being put in next year, because we can't do it this year. Okay, um, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Leader. I just a bit of confirmation. The 185k that's been received for St Cuthbert's Primary School in Kirkcubri that's going towards the art gallery, take it that is part of the 1655 million that's mentioned that right at the top of page 39. And the second one is just really a thank you. It's on page 49, Glenloose Play Park, formation of the footpath to the pedestrian gate to the new skate park. I'm quite sure that'll be welcome for the kids that are actually using the new skate park. It'll save them trudging through the mud. Paul, do you want to do that? Yeah, that, that's correct. It's part of the, the, the funding package for the Kukubri Art Gallery, so that the full 185 is uh, contributing towards the budget for that project. OK, can we go to the recommendations? Can we note one, two, three, Leader, four? can I five? just ask Oh, sorry, John. Sorry, I forgot. Sorry, it's just on page 34, and it's to do with the White Sands Flood Protection Public Realm. Um, Obviously, the committee date was the 10th of November prior to the extensive flooding that happened in that area. And I'm just asking whether or not there's any additional work that's needing to be done now or whether we're progressing as was agreed on the 10th of November. Just, I'm just not clear, so I just wondered if there was anything else that needed to be done. It does say that um, we're projected to spend 100,000 of the 197,000 this year. So I just wanted an update on that. Paul? We've obviously done our end of January monitoring now as well, and uh, the same, still the same figure uh, that's been reflected as the projected year end outcome. So, my understanding is there's no further work being identified as a result of that. 
Over. Just on the back of that, how this is maybe one for the, another committee you can tell me if it is. My understanding is that if we're spending that money on that, how reliable are the figures with regard to the flood proposals? Because I heard that the uh, things are 500% out in some occasions in Hoyt, the forecast. Now, that's a big way out. And if they can't determine that, I was told it was years before we could actually get to proper figures in that and a proper model. So is that something that might affect this cost? No, I th I th the reference to Hoyt was that the flood model used by SEPA to give us the early indication was 500%. Uh, that related to the fact that the Scottish system has is not based upon saturated ground. The level uh, at Hoyt that it, it imagined that it went up to, it was the speed of it that dealt with it. And the White Sands, um, the model, the, the proposal before members would have accommodated the last flood. Uh, based upon that, that what we are uh, working with the Scottish Government and part of the national group is to try and get CEPA to have models that's able to deal with saturated ground so that we're not caught out like places in Newton Stewart or Cray. But the current model is unable to factor in uh, complete, complete ground saturation. That was the issue why Hoyt was unprepared for it, was the fact that, 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 that the model was wrong. But we've had assurances and tested the system that the, the White Sands proposal would have dealt with the last one. Okay, can we go to the recommendations? Can we note one, two, three, four, and five? Okay, if we move on to item seven, which is the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities. <coughs> Members, uh, we have a report here today asking us to consider our membership of COSLA. You will recall that we decided last year to give the required 12 months notice of termination of this council's membership and reserve the right to withdraw our notice at any time before 31st of March 2016. In particular, we were awaiting the outcome of work on the COSLA constitution, standing orders and work programme, and the progress of strengthening the rural voice within the convention. The report provides an update on all these matters and the progress made through convention. However, in the, what it doesn't contain is communications, recent communications uh, that have been, that I've had regarding COSLA itself. And uh, one of them is that I've had a letter from the Scottish Local Government Partnership, which is the four councils, the Aberdeen, Glasgow, Renfrewshire, and South Lanarkshire Council, asking if we would like to come and um, discuss matters of uh, you know, mutual concern with leaders from members' council and Dumfries and Galloway council. And obviously, that's uh, an invitation to speak about what they can do and uh, whether we can fit in anywhere in that. Uh, now, I'm kind of willing to go, and um, you know, I, I don't think we should turn down any invitation on that you know, to actually listen to the information that comes from them. The other communications I've had, and uh, Councillor Maitland, I believe, had some communication from her group in COSLA as well. We've, I've had an invite from David O'Neill, but you know, the report looks at all the aspects that's been covered over the year, and I think we are getting somewhere within, within COSLA and are getting our voice heard more in COSLA through communications that um, you know, members are having with them and getting her voice heard. I believe Jane's been invited on to the uh, COSLA review group through the independent uh, group within COSLA, and I've had communications from David O'Neill uh, regarding the same, inviting one of our group um, to join that uh, COSLA review group. Now that's a, you know, that is uh, quite unique, I think, because there's uh, two members from Dumfries and Galloway Council actually being invited on a group and uh, speaking about the rural aspect, so giving us more say within COSLA. So if you take that on board as well, do you think the way we have uh, 
communicated with COSLA has given us a better say in there. I don't know, we haven't got clarity of everything within COSLA at the moment and uh, where we stand in it, but we are moving forward within that. And I think that's something for you to consider. And whether uh, what we done last year is applicable this year, that we'll be hand we handed in a notice and then we'll withdraw it now. And if we can do the same again next year, uh, you know, join, but give them the 12 months notice uh, and then keep things going until things in you know, all the boxes are actually ticked. So we know where you stand in Dumfries and Galloway. So it's up to members. I'll leave it open to members. Jill? Uh, just on that, Reader, can you advise when the letters were received? I mean, when, when were the invitations received? 19th. The, the Cosla one was um, before that, I think, for Jane and after that for me. Either? Jane, I think that's a, a reasonable uh, direction of travel to actually withdraw and put it in again for another year just to make sure that um, we have the ability <laughs> if um, we don't want to go back into Cosla. So I'm happy with the proposal that you've put forward there. Just wondering if there's any idea with regard to 3.4.5, um, the legal advice obtained by Glasgow City Council. Now, my understanding is that this may end up in a court case. Will we, as a council and part of COSLA, be liable for any costs within that if we actually lose the court case? I would say COSLA, yes. And through that, our membership payments to COSLA, uh, our liabilities within COSLA, would say yes if we lost that. I don't know how far that's going to go. It may be a negotiating position with the other four councils, you know, turning the screw a wee bit on them, but um, I don't know. But yes, it will, it will have an impact on COSLA finances if they lose the case. Um, was it Ian? Thanks, Leader. Uh, I think you've summed it up fairly well as well. I mean, I'm not overly concerned about approaching the other four local authorities. I think COSLA is our best bet. I think we do get value for money in regards to COSLA, the, and would support re remaining a member of that as a council. 3.2 within the report refers to the, the council's uh, representation on COSLA is proportionate, and that's inaccurate. And I just wonder what the way is in order to get that addressed. We come back to that at some point before we go at the end, but that is absolutely inaccurate in regards to the representation. The representation was taken in the council decision at that time, and this is it hasn't changed, it's like anything else. So, um, we got Leader, Jane. Leader, if you don't mind, been, there has been a change since this was an I, I know that, I know that the, so that's inaccurate, know that, you said as well. Okay, I know the makeup of the council has changed, and that was not my doing, but. Anyway, and um, proportionality, Jane, which we recognise at other committees. Um, thank you very much. What I was going to say, um, Leader, is that um, I, I do think, I think you're absolutely right, the fact that we have got representation on these strategic groups, um, and two of us, I think, is, is significant. Um, I, I was going to say, I'm, I'm not sure how we should get um, uh, a, think about getting a, a council view on the, the, the strategic way forward, but I do think we should do our best that it should be a council view um, and, and not merely a group view. I think that's kind of batty because COSLA is all about representation of local government. I, I think it has got a bit hijacked and we've gone, um, we've, we've gone our, our political ways, which is inevitable in some cases, but COSLA is about making certain that local democracy is at the forefront of the, uh, of, of the thinking in the Scottish um, political spectrum. And I would like to um, make certain that I am speaking both on behalf of you know, independent voice, but also actually to be sure that we're all facing the same way. So um, I, I would really like um, somehow to have some sort of um, feed in from all the groups to what I am saying on that particular group. 
And I don't know whether you feel the same way, Lida, but I think that's what we should really endeavour to do. I think um, that all groups, uh, uh, you know, I'm quite willing to listen to what they've got to say, but I won't take the decision in COSLA about what I think is best uh, in, in my representation to that, and as you won't do the same. Uh, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. If they, any group can come in there, they can speak, or they can have the input to the COSLA uh, through me and, and through the convention as their own representatives. The other, the other thing I, I did forget to say was, you know, there was I was talking about the, you know, the cost to to cause if um, they lose the, the court case. One, one of the aspects that says actually in the report is the cost to this council if we don't, uh, if we do leave, and that is, I, I work it out. It's ninety nine thousand, I think ninety odd thousand pounds we, we pay a year. But plus VAT, which makes it about £112,000, and I think it'd be about three times that amount if we, if we left. That's my calculation on that. But again, you know, and whether that's payable, I know it would be open to uh, court cases and things like that as well, and judgments. Sorry, I've got Andy then, John. Um, thanks, Leader. I most has been said, actually, I've been trying again for a wee while, but it obviously is prudent to continue in, um, as we are, but serve notice, as we've done in recent years. I think that's the prudent thing to do. Um, uh, and I would welcome your feedback from your meetings with the big four, as they like to call themselves. Well, if, um, when I arrange a meeting, as I said, there's, um, you know, I, I find it, I think that I should go along and have a meeting with them and listen to what they've got to say. It might be something that the council may be interested in, and I'll bring that back to the council if, uh, how the, to see how the talks go. And we've got Jim. Yeah, thanks, Leader. One one of the things is the what liability should the other group of four decide to take the the court case. Has COSA actually billed this other group for any other liability? Uh, because the liability could be higher if they have billed them or if they haven't billed them, it would only be the legal cost as far as I would be able to work out. And as, uh, as regard Councillor Carruthers, I can see where he's coming from, but 3.2 points out that the Fries and Galloway only has four delegates because of our size. That's what COSLA says were uh, allowed. And the last bullet point at the top of page 60 gives a definition of a political group of at least 61 councillors across Scotland in order to be recognised as a group. Go to Stephen. I wasn't missing you out, Stephen. Thanks, Leader. I think the sort of uh, consensus towards the approach that we're taking in terms of uh, serving notice but remaining as members is sensible. Um, it was just a question on the COSLA levy on page, uh, page 63, 3.6 at the top. Obviously, you've indicated the 93,000 plus VAT, um, which is the, the cost for us at the moment. Uh, and you said you'd done some calculations. I was just wondering if we could maybe hear from Liz about what that would maybe look like. Obviously, that you'd have to bring a report back in terms of what... Um, financial staffing resources required for the alternative um, and necessary expertise, etc. Um, could you give a, a sort of figure for that as well? I appreciate the leader's given one, but just to get a wee bit of backup for that. Yeah. I'll, I'll ask Liz to do that. The calculation I made on the, the 93,000 was £112,176 per year. That's the inclusive of a VAT, but the, the overall figure of the liabilities is calculated about three years on that figure. I don't know if I'm right or not. There are two separate financial issues. One is that if we chose to leave COSLA, clearly our council would need to find some way of accessing expertise, how we engage nationally. And 3.6 is, is about that aspect, that there would be a cost implication um, for finding alternative sources of expertise and information. We haven't costed that out yet. But it would cover issues about policy, finance, and HR, human resources. So that would be the three areas that we would be looking for 
some kind of additional expertise because we wouldn't have access to that from COSLA. The second issue about the cost of leaving COSLA, um, which is a specific um, issue in the COSLA constitution, and that's what the leader was referring to, that proportion um, for our council would be about three times our levy. Um, in terms of whether or not COSLA has billed the four councils, they are clearly reluctant to go into a court battle with member councils because the, the emphasis is about trying to um, get all councils in Scotland to work together. And I think in 3452, um, it just highlights that the discussions are ongoing, that, um, that there, there clearly is a dialogue happening. Um, and COSLA is looking at its budget on a number of different scenarios, one of which is that they don't have um, these councils and memberships. Um, and so they're, they're looking at different ways and means of addressing that. Um, Peter Lennian. Ian. Okay, it was, just, it was that particular point, because Jim's raised it again, I would have left it to the recommendations, but the point I was making was on uh, proportionality. That was all. It wasn't on the, the group who's, it's proportionality specifically. If you do that formula, uh, the, the formula across the council works out different for the representation here. And I made that point. I'm not being very overdramatic about it. Just it's a clear point, and I raise it whenever I get the opportunity. And that's what that's about. It's about proportionality representation. If we applied that as we've applied it recently since the, the, the major change back, it would, it would apply differently. That's why I'm making a point. And how that can be addressed was the question ultimately that was looking to be, to be answered. I suppose we could ask for a report to full council on that. Okay. Uh, is me, uh, are you quite happy to go with the, the you know, to withdraw the notice given for this year and then put in another 12 months notice for the following year? I think that the, the date on page 59, 31st of March 2015 for the withdrawal, was, it should be 2016, but just at the bottom in 3.31. That's just a typo, I think. Okay, so we note 2.1 uh, we've considered and we'll go with this year withdraw notice and uh, give required 12 months notice of termination of this council of COSLA, but reserve the right to withdraw the notice at any time before 31st of March 2017. Uh, Chair, and we've got a 2.3, I believe, as well, where you were going to feed back um, on your meeting. Yeah, I don't, I don't need to put that in as a recommendation. I said that I would do that. Give me feedback. Okay, if we move on to item 8, which is the Dumfries and Galway Council's contribution to the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme. This support provides members with an update in relation to a contribution to the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Scheme. As members know, it's a priority for our council to protect vulnerable people, helping vulnerable families who are innocent victims of war and persecution is simply a humanitarian thing to do. Our council through the Dumfries and Galloway Refugee Crisis Project Board is working with a range of appropriate professional and volunteer groups to prepare our region to host refugee families. The local response to the refugee crisis from our volunteer partners has been quite outstanding and I'm proud uh, of the work done by them and local agencies. The support asks us to consider this Council's contribution to the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme, including progress made to date with partners. We are also being asked to agree to act as accountable organisation in line with Home Office guidance and demonstrate our interest in piloting a national project of English as a second language. Liz is here to answer any questions. Members? Jill? Um, I just through you, Leader, I just wondered um, from a resettlement point of view, how long um, that would normally take for families to resettle and be able to become established in the area that they're coming to. Um, I just wondered if there was any history on that and what sort of time scale would that be? 
I mean, I, I'm not going to I'll, I'll ask Liz to answer that, but it's my feeling that, you know, it's not a quick fix here. This is something we've got to plan for. This is something that could be over a 10 year period, you know, before, uh, you know, everything's settled within that. So, but I'll let Liz answer that. The concept is that the Syrians that are coming over here resettle permanently. This is to be their new home. Um, the scheme provides for them to get benefits for the first five years. But the intention is that after that, they have established themselves in the community. Can I come back on that? I, I mean... I would, I would have thought it might take longer than the five-year period for them to be settled and integrated. And I just wondered um, if there was any way forward with going back to the government to ask about that. Because when you look at the plan and you also look at the amount of expertise and assistance that's needing to be put in place from an administrative point of view for this council, all of that comes with a cost, an additional cost. And I just think as a council that we should be asking some questions about that. I do agree that we should run the pilot scheme. I wholeheartedly agree that it's the right thing to do, but I would also be asking um, if there was any additional funding. There is some uh, limited international experience about the resettlement of Iraqis and Afghans, um, particularly the Ayrshire's Glasgow and Edinburgh have received um, refugees from different countries. But there isn't a great body of evidence to show that long-term resettlement. Um, but the evidence that is available from the previous schemes is that people do quite quickly settle into their new communities, particularly if they have children um, who are at school and they become very much part of the community. As you can gather in, in 3.5, we're highlighting that the national group um, and the um, migration partnership are doing a lot of research just to make sure these very points are being addressed and that if there is a requirement for funding and support in the longer term that that's made available. Andy? Um, thanks very much, Leader. Uh, I mean, obviously, we have to welcome you know, the work that's been done here and, and the volunteers that have got involved. I'm just picking up on a couple of things. Um, the, the food banks at least we know one in Dumfries that's um, currently um, I just received some funding quite recently from the uh, Common Good Fund because they are getting increasing numbers of other um, uh, stateless people, for example, or uh, it's not quite the same thing. But I'm wondering if there's uh, a place here for those those people on uh, the strategic group um, uh, because they're also picking up others. I appreciate it's not the, exactly the same thing, but um, you know, is there a chance here to interlink? And I'm very aware that it's a very direct funding for a very direct purpose. Yeah, um, and I, I think, given the, the, the eyes of the world are going to be on us, you know, we'll have to make sure that we've got an evidence-based approach and we can evidence every single penny that we spend. And it's actually maximised to help the people rather than getting taken up in the running of the organisation. I think the project team are very mindful of the fact that this is a small group of people and it's a specific project and that we need to have a measured and balanced approach to how this group of people are being dealt with in our region compared to other people who may have um, particular needs and requirements. There is a, a project in the anti-poverty strategy about food banks, about eating, etc. So the issue about the increasing number of people from all sorts of different communities and backgrounds using food banks will be addressed as part of that. But the project team um, really has been working very well and has taken that, that wider perspective about making sure that we're linking in to other strategies and other in initiatives across the region. Thank you. I think one of, the, one of the things we don't want to get into, because you know this is a completely separate uh, issue and it's a completely separate funding stream as well, is we don't want it to be seen as the, the you know people buying in that are buying in and putting them in food banks. So we don't know when that kind of message there because it is a completely different funding stream and completely different thing we're trying to achieve with that. 
uh, members. No. Okay, uh, can we note one, agree two, and agree three? Oh, sorry, Ian. No, that's no bother. It was, it was just I mean, very pedantic. When I looked at uh, recommendation 2.3, the word R's in the middle, is that, should that be taken out? It's just when I read it, it maybe shouldn't have been there. Just when we were getting a recommendation. Is that, I'm being very pedantic. Sorry about that, but just. Okay. We'll change that. Okay, if we move on to item nine, which is the grant awards council's major events strategic fund. Um, the report provides uh, for members consideration and approval of grant awards to major festivals and events projects as recommended by the Dumfries and Galway Events Partnership. The grant awards form a core aspect of the council's work to deliver uh, with project partners, the Regional Major Festivals and Events Strategy 2014-17. to The strategy has funded some world-class events in the past, such as World Championship Ice Hockey and International Sheepdog Trials, and has led to more than 30 events coming to the region in the last three years. These events have a positive effect on our local economy and communities, with visitors and spectators all coming to the region to stay with us, and enjoy our hospitality and activities. The success of the strategy is very much as a result of the creativity and hard work of organisers and support of our local communities with those visiting our region. The help we provide is, is vital in sustaining these events and I believe our approach is the best in rural Scotland. As well as the funding being recommended to the nine festivals and events this year, we fund events that bring people from across the world to our region. Big Burn Supper is a council's beacon event and receives international exposure. As well as this, we fund Spring Fling, the Arts Festival and the World Famous Book Festival. These festivals help to put Dumfries and Galway firmly on the cultural map. Harry is here to answer any questions. Members, we've got Jill. Just a query later on whether or not um, we should be actually allocating funding to when the budget setting not till Monday. I, I, I may have read this incorrectly. Um, is the money already sitting in the major event budget um, and can't be touched? Or, or what, what's the position on this? Um, there is uh, some prior commitment uh, uh, within the budget. Um, the at paragraph 374, uh, clearly the events uh, in the upper half of that table uh, are, are already committed. Um, the funding, uh, the 77,000 and the sector development funding uh, is uh, the, the sum that members are being asked to consider today uh, and, and is not yet committed. Okay, we've got Ivor. Here, along with that one, there's also the fact that have a, an appendix here which doesn't tie up with the report. Um, if you read the appendix, we go from Anne and Rising Marches wanting £5,000 to the Eden Festival looking for £12 um, to the Galloway Hills Rally wanting £900 and Jazz Festival Lockerbie wanting £700. Yet in the report, they're all for thousands. I think this is something we need to know exactly what this is, to be a wee bit kind of mix and match. I think it's probably a typo, Harry. Uh, Chair, I think there is a typo in the appendix. Uh, clearly there was a commitment to the Eden Festival to recommend an award. It should have been recommended award of thousands of pounds. Just about the money, um, I don't know if I'm getting my, my MESF and my MSES mixed up or whatever, but uh, there's a total there of 299,500 
I'm reading it, there's 250k allocated, so it doesn't really allude to the 449,500 and elsewhere in the report, or not clearly in a way I can understand easily. I was just wondering if you could explain what we're actually being asked to do here. Uh, my understanding is that there is some uh, carry forward procedures here, uh, and that uh, when funds available for 200,500 uh, is being asked to allocate, uh, a consider an award of 77,000 pounds for this grant and uh, allocate. So the, so the carry forward is more than the 299 um, we're being asked to determine today? No, the, the um, carry forward is uh, the, the, core, the core budget of 250 plus the carry forward is And how much is the carry forward? Sorry for yourself. Uh, how much is the carry forward? It's just I couldn't see where the carry forward was in the paper. Again, uh, my understanding is there's 49,500 due to um, cancellation of events that were scheduled to be awarded. Sorry, Leader, last last shot, but I appreciate that. It's just that reading this, I can't. Can I, you see it in the paper? I can't see, see it. Yeah. Yeah. Can I see it reflected in the paper? And that's maybe just yeah, something that's been missed there, out yeah. the 49,000. But it is, you can guarantee that it's carried forward 49,500 from here. And if they. Jim. Thanks, Leader. An issue which arose last year. Most of the events are detailed, the locations are stated, but there is one, the Sanctuary Environmental Arts Festival. There seems to be a lack of clarity about where this festival takes place. Uh, Leader, the, the Sanctuary Festival last year certainly took place in Portmotry. Uh, just outside Newton Stewart, my understanding would be that that's where the venue is again. Can I ask, uh, Leader, that in future the locations be clearly stated? Where they are location specific, we certainly can do that. Jill? Thank you, um, I'm still not sure we should be going ahead with this report, but that is in that I would like to ask a question on the Lockerbie Jazz Festival application. I find it quite interesting that the uh, Lockerbie Jazz Festival apply for something and then there's a condition attached that is completely separate and suggests that they have to work with the railway station to actually promote something else. But I, I just I, I find that quite difficult to get my head round about that we're actually now going back to somebody that either they've applied for funding for a particular issue and they're going to get it or they're not going to get it but to attach an additional condition telling them that it has to work with another organisation quite difficult. Um, generally these conditions of grant will be in accordance with the application so um, the, my, my educated guess and it is a guess to some extent is that the festival will have indicated its willingness to do so in terms of working with Abelio and with the train operating company to use the station more effectively. So, so it's not a diktat, is that what you're saying? It's not a diktat. No, it's it's very much in accordance, but very much in accordance with their grant application. Well, you you did say that that would be a, a guess that that was what they said. I'm not trying to be too critical, but the report is quite poor. We're being asked to make decisions without having the full information in front of us. And I, I just don't feel comfortable about that from a governance point of view. OK, Andy. Um, th thanks, Leader. Um, I, I think I don't think you can actually delay making a decision. If the money's there to use, the money's there to use. A lot of the organisations here involved are actually running to international timetables uh, way beyond our control. And if we don't um, you know, decisively move on it now, um, we would put at risk some of these things uh, because uh, the international calendars are such that's the case. 
bit with the Gallery Hills Rally and the uh, Circle of the Cross. Um, so that, that's really, I think we should be moving on this. Now you should be decisive, as I said. Jim? Yeah, thanks, Peter. like to have seen the point from the Greens that we didn't have to try and figure out where the forty million and a half was coming from and the next report that we just heard from Mr. Green said that uh, I've only just had one small criticism of the Anne and Tight Man. I'm afraid to say that it's a unique spectacle in Dumfries and Galloway. It isn't unique. It happens at Gen Grove, Lowland Gavern, Stranraer as well. Not unique in Dumfries and Galloway. Stephen? Yeah, I appreciate you letting me back in, Leader. It was just actually a wee point on the Lockerbie Jazz one. Uh, I'm sort of intrigued now that it's been highlighted um, just wh what a belly will do at Lockerbie Railway Station. Uh, I know you've got a previous uh, previous hat that you might be able to wear, but I'm pretty sure they don't run any services there. Uh, leader, a belly will do, do manage Lockerbie Railway Station, uh, although they don't run any services. Abelio would be the first point of contact in terms of information itself, and clearly uh, it would be uh, best if we need to also make contact with the first trans Pennine and with uh, uh, Virgin and Circle Service. Colin? Thanks very much, Leader. I think we're, we're, we're losing sight a wee bit here of what this report's actually all about, which is about investing in what is a real success story for this region, which is a a range of events and festivals that, that stretch the length and breadth. And I think one of the encouraging things about the report today is that, that the recommendations do, in fact, reach the whole of the region from, from east right across to west. It's a massive success story. At the end of 2014, the events that we funded brought in a, an economic impact of over £10 million to this region. It, it helps support the fact that we, we bring in about £300 million a year through tourism, and that supports 7,000 jobs in Dumfries and Galloway. It's a competitive market out there. We've got to give people a reason to visit this region and our festivals and events are a major reason for that. And there's no doubt that one of the reasons why the events and festivals are so successful is the support Dumfries and Galloway Council provides. Uh, what we've got on the list today is a number of new events and new festivals um, that hopefully will grow um, in the same way that previous events and festivals this council supported have also grown as well. It's a massive success story and it's something we should be investing in. I mean, suggestions that we don't have a budget. Well, the reality is we do have a budget. We've got a three-year budget and unless somebody amends that, on Monday and removes funding from this, we've got an allocate funding allocation of £250,000 per year for the major event strategy. I think the big debate becomes what do we do after that funding um, ends this financial year, basically, and how do we actually take this to the next level and really make it an international uh, festival and event strategy. But what we've achieved is, is significant in the last few years, and it's something this council should be proud of, and we should be proud to support these things. I think Andy hits it the nail on the head when he says we don't agree with funding today. A number of these events, frankly, will have to plan without that funding um, because they take place, in some cases, within the next two or three months. This committee doesn't meet again until um, half or halfway through April. Uh, the idea we should wait until then before we allocate funding um, is, is, in my view, uh, going to be detrimental to these uh, organisations and these events, and that means being detrimental to this council and the local economy. Jane. Well, the events champion has just wielded his sword of truth and his buckler of encouragement, and I'm right behind him with my axe. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, no, uh, Leader, on page 89, um, actually, uh, Colin raised the issue about the, the, um, the application of budgets, and the condition of grant in the um, rally is about top sizing 5,000 from the 1718 budget. And I just wonder whether that's actually appropriate at this point. I don't know whether we absolutely have to do that. Could somebody help me with that, page 89? Sorry, have you got a paragraph number, gentlemen? It's in the appendix, um, appendix one. It's the. Uh, the um, yeah, sorry, yeah. I missed the number before it's page 89. Look at the. Saying the condition of grant, none from 2017, it is proposed that the Galloway Hills Rally does not go through the competitive application process of major events, strategic funds, 
funded together with the Scottish Valley Summer Gallery, revenue budget drawn by retention. This budget com comprised the existing £21,000 revenue budget for Scottish and £5,000 taken out of the 2017-18 MFES budget. Leader, I, I think this is, has been held over from previous drafts of the appendix, and uh, uh, this should be subject to further report and further in the report and further review and further discussion. So that's in 2.3, you're talking yep. about it. Further report, future the Yep. Okay, uh, John first. Thank you, Leader. Just for the record, I am not criticising any of the previous events in Dunfrith and Galloway and the good work that the people do who run the event. Um, however, I am criticising, um, as you say, in some cases, the report that's in front of us, we have a duty to scrutinise. That is what I'm doing for the record. Thank you. Okay, Andy. Um, thanks very much, Leader. Uh, Harry kind of answered uh, what I, the point I was really trying to make about the international uh, calendar, because the international calendar for rallies and uh, international ice skating union and other uh, some other participants like the Scottish Pipe Band Association if there is a competition um, they're set years in advance not months and the international calendar that we're talking about here will for those three in particular will have already been set so unless we agree the funding we need to move on it's been covered here I think and get the job done okay I'll, I'll go to the recommendations uh, can we note 2.1 can we approve the funding? Point two. And can we agree to receive a further report on future development? Okay, and perhaps uh, it might be laid out a bit better the next time as part of the report. Okay, if we move on to item 10 which is the Dumfries Asset Plan. As members know, as a council, we're determined to make best use of all our assets, including having fewer but better buildings. We have already uh, reduced significantly the number of properties the council has across the region. This has not only cut our daily running costs, but has brought income into the council through the sale, and surplus of, sale of surplus property. We have also recognised that to be a modern and efficient organisation, we need to think differently and therefore work smarter. In order to tackle cutbacks and meet efficiency savings, this means streamlining services and reducing premises. The report on the future of council buildings focuses primarily on Dumfries, with further reports to follow in other areas around the region. We recognise, however, that we have to balance the need to cut the number of buildings with not leaving lots of empty boarded up properties within the town centre. We therefore need to pick the properties that are surplus to our needs, but are also likely to be sold. Members are presented with an appraisal of options to deliver the Dumfries Asset Plan. Offices focus saving, which was agreed as part of the 2015-16-17-18 budget, delivering a fewer and uh, better buildings commitment. Buildings have been assessed on an individual basis, taking into account a number of criteria, including accessibility to services, accessibility for employees, improved integration, and collaborative working. The options take into consideration whether buildings can be repurposed, which is difficult for listed and historical buildings, selling some of their assets or looking at smarter working and creatively thinking how our buildings could be used to make them more effectively used. The Council is required to deliver savings of £335,000 per annum by 2017-18 as part of the agreed budget. The report states that providing the right buildings are retained within the Council's portfolio and with the correct long-term investment to ensure their sustainability and suitability, a total of £495,000 per annum could, could actually be achieved. We as this year um, 
to answer any questions arising from the report. Members? Jane? Um, Leader, I, nothing really particularly to ask because we had a, an, a session um, with Louise um, and I think we picked through the detail at that point and uh, everyone, I think, was very enthusiastic about it. I think um, it's been a very long time in coming, but it's uh, comprehensive. It looks as if it is deliverable, and I'm really very enthusiastic. So um, I, I look forward to us managing to deliver on it. Thank you. Thank you. It, just you mentioned it in your opening um, speech just about we don't want to have buildings uh, that belong to the council to become unused uh, in the centre of town. I absolutely agree with that. Nothing more depressing. What I'm quite interested in, and it's on page 137 of the um, draft expansion plan, and it just, I, I mean, I'm just looking down where we are tenants as opposed to owner occupiers. And apart from Cargan Tower, which I quite understand why we were there, and, and that was all agreed when that all started, um, I just kind of wonder why we remain as tenants in these places if we are paying a rent and paying running costs, if we have other um, buildings that we could use that we are owner-occupied in. And the one that completely hits me is Monmouth House. Monmouth House, is that the data? Uh, Monmouth House seems to be the same because that is also that the councillor has made quite a lot of investment in particular with regard to IT infrastructure and also some of the repairing of IT infrastructure and back up with the NHS. Um, it's also a place of view which uh, offers itself well to some of the, the work and practice that we need to adopt and doesn't require any further significant investment in the direction of that. Um, primarily it's investment that's already been made in it and particularly to help IT relocate that elsewhere in the town. I would be quite understanding if that was the case and it could be affordable to us uh, with the existing infrastructure in place. But all of that uh, uh, range of buildings is what we would need apart from one we have to have the rent of one. So, so the rented ones, you know, the likes of Parliament House have been declared the last two? Oh, right. I didn't, yes. I didn't, I didn't see yes. that. Um, do you think that over 600,000 is good value for that building year on year, it, it, which will presumably go up? It, it's not over 600,000. The total revenue cost for one week per year are 450,000, 194,000 oh, rented and included within that figure. That's important. And you think that's good value? It, it, it is, given the, the, the amount of infrastructure that we've got in that building. It's a building with a high uh, load because of all the IT does have a reflection in the, in the, in the cost um, and the, the rent that we're paying will reflect the, the rent that uh, the market rent that is uh, taking up the rent of the building. Thank you. Okay, uh, Colin. Thank you very much, Leader. You mentioned earlier about um, Portsmouth containing all the information members, members need, and I have to say the complete opposite. It's as far as this report is concerned, it's incredibly comprehensive and I think it's incredibly well written. I think the actual the thought process going through the different options is, is, is actually fascinating to read. I think we'd all like to maybe hope that we could have gone further, but I think when you look at the actual recommended option and the reasons behind that, we don't want, frankly, property sitting empty um, in the middle of Dumfries Town Centre because we can't get rid of them and, and, and obviously significant capital costs that would be involved in, in going any further. So I think that the recommendation is, is spot on and gets, gets the... Um, it get, get, gets the direction of travel and, and correct. Um, and I think one of the, the, the really positive things from my point of view is that I suppose it's almost the elephant in the room for, for some time, and that's been the future of Gracefield um, Arts Centre. Um, you know, we've kind of um, made decisions to that will ultimately release a number of properties in and around that site, um, and, and this hopefully will, will, will pave the way for also releasing what is currently Gracefield Arts Centre and looking for a, 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 a location more in the centre of Dumfries Town. I think that it's a fantastic facility um, at the moment, but you know, the idea of having that in the town centre would help regenerate the town centre, bring more people to that particular facility. So not only are we saving funds in 
um, by reducing the number of properties, we're actually, I think, improving uh, the offer we have by, by hopefully moving Greyfield into the uh, into the town centre. We're looking at a site um, that has obviously um, got good uh, development opportunities. So I think the, the recommendations are spot on. I'd like to see it go faster and quicker and make more savings, and I'm sure that it, all the uh, members of staff and the property team will be aiming to do that in the, the months ahead. But I think the uh, I think the recommendation we've got before us is spot on, and um, it's, it's a really comprehensive and good piece of work. Jim. Thanks, Leader. I understand that the Wood Bank building is scheduled to close with the staff transferring elsewhere. Could you tell me where the staff are going to transfer to? Uh, th there's some of the staff which will be transferring to Iris Street, and there's some that will be coming to this uh, campus, although they may be locating elsewhere temporarily because we can't park on the campus as far as parking and we park that traffic so we don't have staff that are within Woodbank at the moment will temporarily relocate to uh, Lost Sideway Street and Fletcher and St Tony's House and probably a couple of other places as well but uh, we just can't because obviously we had to make an arrangement with Woodbank that we would uh, take the work down to Woodbank and then we would be able to provide the Leader, has consideration been given to the extra demand for car parking if you know, that move takes place? Yes, uh, th that has been uh, given consideration. We'll continue to work on that. The, the total numbers of staff uh, aren't going to, to increase, um, but we will have a few areas such as this uh, campus where there will be um, more staff and we'll be able to get in at Cargan as well. At Cargan we're actually working on something just now to increase the number of uh, parking spaces there um, and we'll revisit parking layouts in this uh, area as well and also look at uh, cycle to work schemes we're providing within um, all the, the, the easily furbished properties and um, the location for people who do want to cycle to work but whose showers aren't there at the moment. So all of that is being factored in and we'll maximise uh, parking as much as we can, but it will be a balance of with um, encouraging uh, the other forms of transport as well. Jim. Uh, thanks, Leader. Excuse me, the quickest in the draw there. Uh, I actually agree with Paul and this is actually been well thought out before. I don't have a problem with the actual escalation. There is just one little thing regarding the details that are in 3.26. Uh, this asset class is 3.7 million per annum. And then we've got the details at 3.28 showing what this project is going to cost if we go with the recommendations. I have what assurances do members have that, that sit out with them to their council buildings are not going to suffer considering the incoming financial year we're going to spend over 56% of the actual available funding and then the following two years it's over 78% of the available funding is going to be spent merely on this project. We have a whole lot of other council buildings in Upper Nithdale and the other three, the other three areas as well that we have to Um, yes, we're, we're aware of that and putting together the proposals, which is why we've um, not allocated it entirely to, to this project for non schools. Um, there will be uh, some choices to be made in how the remaining 800,000 for these schools is going to be spent, um, but the, the intention is to ensure that we're dealing with what needs to be dealt with during that period and then beyond that, planning for um, any other spends are starting to become uh, more po more um, urgent or pressing uh, beyond that period to maintain uh, enough money to deal with what we can foresee is going to be required over the next few years. Jeff, I just can just come back in on that. 
So really the short answer is, while this project's ongoing, we'll really be doing the bare minimum uh, with the bridge. We'll be dealing with what we need to deal with. Okay, Ivor. Yeah, I think this is the time to cash on the holy grail. Um, we've actually signed a deal to look at about two or three years. We have had three passes of the MSR over the last three or four now, but we need to actually this is the time to actually start grabbing those because to be honest, I'm similar to Councillor Smith, I welcome the deal to be done but speedily as possible. Saving uh, a good job to do, and we don't need to see any problems with the bridge. Some builders will look out the window and see that the bridge is going to be basically up and running in no time. Thanks for that, Jane. Th thank you very much. Um, the only thing I think that is missing from this, um, actually, is the piece of work which we have asked for, um, I think, through the business transformation um, group um, about how we are going to centralise or decentralise our activities. We've got technology now. We are having a, a, a throwing up of staff in the air, particularly with Wood Bank. A um, lot of staff there um, who actually work for um, schools, which are spread right across the whole region. Um, and I would like to ask the chief executive um, whether there have been any thoughts at all as to the opportunity afforded to decentralise. Also, when we are going to receive um, uh, that piece of work, which I think um, the Director of the Community is going to be able to receive it. The answer, short answer is no. Um, not at this point, until uh, the new budget is discussed in the Council and the Cabinet. But actually, the relocation that we're talking about Instead of the cost, the staff will be here to make the case. We've got the details as well, but absolutely we're committed to doing that work and uh, moving forward to have the direct response to that. And certainly it will be part of the consideration when we start getting the details of those things. But at this point, we have in fact already uh, made that decentralised and we are certainly following on with the piece of work that we've been asked for. And the work that we are certainly looking to bring to bear. The education sector and the water sector. We did commit to bring that to bear. Okay, we've got Stephen then, Tom then, finishing up. Thanks, Leader. It was just, just on the back of that, just regarding staff and the impact. Um, I mean, there's a lot of staff currently based in the buildings that are being considered, um, but then there's the staff that actually serve and maintain those buildings, like cleaning staff, etc. Uh, and it's just to give a shout out to them, because a lot of them have been making up their hours by. Um, the different buildings that, that are on the estate that they service. So it's just to ensure that they've been sort of consulted and informed because obviously they're going to have to replan how they make up their hours for these cleaning contracts. Uh, what happens is regular discussions with the Chief Executive and the Council when we get the matter to us, whether we might not have answered it accurately in the last meeting, but we are going to uh, go to the Council and see how we can make that happen. Tom? Th thanks, Chairman Leader. I think we should go on with this. I mean, I know this has been going on for 20 years now since the five local authorities merged, and there has been a mixture of parochialism and uh, prevarication, mainly by elected members, but this hasn't happened sooner. Let's go on with it. Let's get the job done, and uh, no, no more wasting time. Okay, can we move to the recommendations? Can we, we've considered one, can we note two and seven? And agree three, four, five, and six. Thank you. Move on to item 11, which is an update and delivery of budget savings, formation, and evaluation joint board. The report provides members with outcomes from a joint feasibility review of the formation and evaluation joint board with Scottish Borders Council which was set out in a three-year budget proposal agreed by full council in February 2015. Members will recognise that joint valuation board arrangements are a feature of local government in some parts of Scotland. The approach from the Scottish Borders Council to examine this 
presented opportunities to capture efficiency savings from a shared service. The report in front of us provides a summary of the outcomes from the work carried out on the feasibility of shared arrangements. The recommendations of the study carried out by a business analyst from Scottish Borders Council concluded that there are risks and other factors which would limit the effectiveness of this arrangement and also limit any efficiency that could be achieved. Officers are therefore proposing that alternative measures identified during the review are delivered that would secure the agreed savings. And I think what it's saying is that it costs us money if we, if we just did it the other way and would not benefit us. So we find the savings in the house. Members? Stephen? Thank you. Um, it's just with interest that I was looking at 3.32 and page 149. Uh, I mean, that effectively is a chessboard with no move left to make. Um, so it was <coughs> hardly surprising that we were going to have to end up finding the savings internally. Um, that's all I'd have to say on that. Okay, can we go to the recommendations? Consider the one note two and three and degree four. Thank you. Move on to item 12, which is the service review contract management. Uh, this report presents options to deliver the outcomes of the service review and contract management and seeks members' approval for implementation. The review is one of the programme of service reviews and follows an extensive exercise using the Council's agreed service, uh, service review approach. The committee agreed the scope and outcomes of this review on the 22nd of September 2015, and this report provides a comprehensive consideration and evidence in relation to delivering those outcomes and a preferred way forward from the review team to deliver these. We have uh, Rona and Tate here uh, to answer any questions. We'll open up to members. Jill. Thank you, Leader. Um, I think this is a very valuable piece of work. Uh, it's obviously been quite a difficult task to get it to this stage, um, and I would like to thank the project team for getting it to this stage. It's taken a long time. I think, obviously, um, reading the report, you can see that we have had some issues and problems in the past. Hopefully, moving forward, a lot of this will be addressed. Um, I want to ask a particular question surrounding terms and conditions, working gallery terms and conditions. In the report, it says um, that the council would be likely to use um, government terms and conditions some of those terms and conditions as they currently stand don't take into consideration um, the likes of um, subcontractor and also um, health and safety issues as well as indemnity problems and the terms and conditions that are currently in place at the moment. And I just want to have an assurance that the Council is looking at beefing up their own terms and conditions. It's not really mentioned on, in the report, but I would just like an assurance that that's going to happen. Um, thank you. Yes, uh, terms and conditions often we use the Scottish Government's basic terms and conditions and also write our own bespoke conditions for each contract, but absolutely agree that should be a, a part of the work that this uh, is, is undertaken going forward. And I think particularly in capital projects, there's examples where they're, they're professional and in industry, uh, for want of a better word, terms and conditions that people use. And we've got a little bit of work to do just to make sure people aren't putting out conflicting terms and conditions sometimes uh, in the same contract. So um, I think we'll work through all those issues as part of this uh, project going forward. Ian. Thanks, Leda. As the previous speaker said, I think this is a really, really good report. Uh, we discussed it at the Business Transformation Steering Group. So is it's excellent. The, the only point I think I would raise, I've raised a couple of points I've raised in the past, maybe not for this meeting in particular, but I think procurement itself uh, actually should have a, a higher profile as what it's got. It shouldn't be at the, one of the last items on uh, the policy and resources. It should have its recognised within its own committee. That maybe should be taken to a separate committee for the new convene. I'll raise that again separately. But 3.39, just for the, in regards to that, clearly there's a targets there identified from what from my understanding of the reading are just over half a million pounds worth of savings. I mean that looks against 181 million, nearly 182 million that's it looks pretty low. So I just wonder 
say to Vin, we've got there's, there's room for improving the skill sets, the team basic up so on and so forth, and we're moving in that direction. So what could this possibly be looking like next year in regards to savings? I mean, I would like to see an improvement there. I think that's less than half a percent in real terms, way below that less than half a percent. But it, it does look pretty poor to, to on the face of it, but clearly there's a there's rhetoric behind that within the report, but just like a, a verbal explanation if possible. Okay, I'll get Gavin to take that, but yeah, but I mean, I've, we, we've had a look at that as well. I think to be clear that this is about managing the contract. We're just getting better value from the contracts that we have, as opposed to the other reviews that have been looking at procurement of contracts, which is an issue that members have been scrutinising. I think at this point, uh, these are what we believe to be deliverable savings, and certainly with very strong direction from members both to scrutiny committee, uh, audit committee, and from the subcommittee, that they must have absolute rigour around going off contract. This is the first step until we get the contract registered in place, the full information from members, to allow members as part of the next budget process to really drive and determine where further savings could be made. But I think this is about make smarter use of the contracts that we have as opposed to the other piece of work, which is about the future procurement to get better value from the contract. So through this year, we're able to present members more fulsome information as well as opportunities building the recommendations to make the changes. But you know, um, at this point, we're confident that we can that, that we can get at least half a million pounds that have been approved with, with further information from members' direction, uh, probably in advance of the next budget setting process to allow members to further make Hey, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Peter. I mentioned this going up in the great grief and the Monday morning. I think this report is sorely needed. It appears to me as if we have been placing staff in a position of doing contract management when they have no actual real formal training. And I've no doubt, as Councillor Dykes mentioned, we've had some problems in the past. I've no doubt some of those officers have actually sat in here and been grilled quite severely by elected members when they actually didn't have the, the organisation didn't actually give them the proper training to carry out contract management. I think that is a ridiculous situation to be putting any member of staff into. If we expect them to actually carry out something, we should be supplying the training. Morning. It's good to have a bit of a generic approach to contract management. I just wondered, at local level, where we have service level agreements, you know, that are run by the area managers, does that same generic criteria apply to that? Because you know, it's supposed to deliver an outcome. I, I know it's a lesser level, but it's still important because it, it all adds up to quite a substantial sum of money across the region. Yes, I, I think you make a really good point. We've got a lot of service level agreements that are just really contracts by another name. And we'd certainly be giving those people the same training and, and uh, making sure they've got access to the same resources when they're having their regular uh, meetings with the people that are providing and, and supposed to be delivering these outcomes. Jill, Jill. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I just have a mix to ask one other question earlier. Um, it's really to do with uh, the procurement cycle and the need for contract managers to be in at the very beginning of the procurement cycle rather than what we've done historically is bring people in at the end of the cycle and they may never have seen the contract that they're actually being asked to manage in the first place um, and I just think it is really important and it is good practice to make sure whoever's doing that contract management is in at the beginning of the procurement cycle. Definitely. Andy? Um, thanks, Leader. Um, I'm, I really welcome the, uh, meeting of the opportunity to train staff. And I'm, I'm just, it's just a very open question here. Is, are we looking at appropriate training at all levels of the Council staff, and not only those who are actually directly involved in the monitoring and management of contracts? Because the frontline staff, um, you know, if, if they had some basic awareness training, and how they would report back if they felt something wasn't getting delivered or should have been getting delivered. Um, how far down are we looking at training? 
I think the review teams recognise that, that different staff, depending on their responsibilities and involvement, will need different types of training from the very intense negotiation skills that might be needed for a multi-million pound contract down to just a, a, a general awareness. Um, I think that that's a good point and one of the ideas that one of the team had was to use uh, the internet-based you know, training courses uh, through Flow that, are, that just give people a general run-through about what they might be looking for and certainly where they report any concerns that they've got about one of our suppliers um, in terms of the contracts that we have. Jane. Um, uh, Lydia, could I possibly ask, um, perhaps, perhaps take you this, but I, I cannot remember where or, and how this is going to be reported to members, to which um, committee and how, because um, I think I think that's extremely important. In some ways, uh, that that's been superseded somewhat by the review of schemes. Uh, work that's been going on and I think the suggestion at the last meeting was that procurement uh, that would include contract management uh, is, is a more regular feature on the Policy and Resources Committee but that's I think still under further discussion at the review of schemes and it'll come to full council at the end of March for a final decision. Right, Jane. Contract register that got to come in. Is, is each department going to have their own register, or is it going to be a fairly central one? And if it's going to be a central one, I mean, I know it's normally done by chief registrar, but but um, who's going to monitor it? And who's, you know, you're, you're looking to you know, it says here there will be an opportunity to analyse contracts to see if you can trace the one. Is that going to spot that? We have a, a contract man, a contract register at the moment that, that's just been for internal use, basically for the procurement team uh, for the last couple of years, and it is uh, computerised and it is able to be broken down by department. And obviously, we're going to have to change those now with the reshaping of the council to make sure that they, they sit in the correct places. But essentially, it is about that relationship between the procurement officers, between the finance officers and the managers in a department to be now using the contracts register as, as a weekly, if not monthly, tool uh, that, that they use to see where their spend is and to make sure that contracts that are coming up for, for tender and renewal, all that's programmed properly. And this will give them visibility to do that. But it is a, it's a joint, it has to be a joint effort between all those uh, sections to get the information correct. Um, in procurement, there is someone who, who does that analyst role at the moment, but what we're suggesting in the review is that we actually have that analyst post so that people will be looking through to see if they have future flow. I have concerns about the people looking at that matter. I don't think actually when that's not on the line to say we're doing this well or we're not doing it. Who, who's actually going to come to the committee and say this is what all Council Council, whatever it is, is doing is really well or we've got a problem with it. Somebody's got to make that decision. And it has to be audited as well. But somebody's got to be up in front of the audit and say this is what we're doing. No, so I take the point. Um, th we have asked for the contract management, the manager uh, within the procurement, the contracts manager and an analyst, that will be their job to monitor and, and, and to send out messages. But obviously the resource for, for actually doing it and making sure that, that it's an active, um, active participation by the department will be those other people. But the responsibility for saying that something's going wrong and to, to do that analysis will lie in the central procurement team with those posts. An extra level that, that from the, from the development of a management structure for, for, for the subcommittee just now, um, each service is dented by the head of service or the business manager, let's say. So we're actually putting a, a properly qualified accountant and business manager in which contract managers will be placed in their, their job description. They will be, that will be part of their responsibilities to ensure. The other issue which raises each contract contract register will be available to members 
but it, it's not it's not something that obviously that's within the issues of confidentiality, particularly when it comes to gender. But absolutely, members need to have access to it to be able to see it, to ask the appropriate questions in terms of remit. Certainly, uh, I can put the construction out, change all services to contract to everything, completely reviewed by the management team and available from each of us. So therefore, I think that will take us a huge point forward from this. I think from, from the Working Scrutiny Committee, this sort of secrecy that seems to sit around it. But actually, we as members having that information be able to ask appropriate questions, but also in service commissions be able to ask questions and provisions and get, get guidance and feedback on that. I think that will take us to that new level of transparency that we need. Follow up. I do realise it's CD first to doing the pilot um, for it, and I just wonder how long that, how long the pilot is, um, you know, what the picture says about it, what we will see. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, as members who are aware, we do have a look, look at Scottish Parliament, um, and what we're looking to this pilot is for us to kind of approach the House um, Facilities Management and Building Services and staff at the moment. Um, basically, the process is 6,000 employees a year, um, and there will be no additional support required to this uh, system and service delivery under that um, and it's also that we can kind of decide where we stand on going forward. Um, the opportunity was taken through facilities management which was developed through the Providence branch so we have good local procurement, local advice, we've got good members of technical team who are just now going local to McClellan Street, um, <coughs> Brown's Leg Yogurt and also the other and through that, I'm looking at um, challenging the price of existing national contracts and trying to say, save £30,000 in tax revenue and get the IT kit volumised, but save the system. So it's looking at that juncture and um, progressing that through the application of funds and through other services. And we now have that bigger opportunity to kind of look at how we can bring in more services and that will come together with the process of the bill that we have. Jim. Yeah, thanks, Edith. Thanks for letting me back in. My last contribution was to have a real go at reorganisation and kind of putting staff into positions that they haven't been given the contract and they've not been given enough training. And there's the flip side of that. When I mentioned that I've no doubt that several members of staff have been sitting in this chamber and being grilled by elected members when they didn't have sufficient training. That's the case, and I was one of those that could be seen as being given a grilling to staff that didn't have the right training to carry out the job I was expecting them to do. I apologise. Okay, can we go to the recommendations? We've reviewed one. Can we agree two and three? Okay. Chair, so, can sorry. I just um, confirm that we will add in that we will want a, a fuel for temporary well, okay, that will be an action plan. Moving on to uh, item 13, which is fair treatment work policy. Members are asked to approve the, the refresh fair treatment work policy following extensive consultation. The fair treatment work policy was agreed by committee in November 2013. This policy replaced the Council's existing bullying and dignity at work policies. Its review is part of the Organisational Development and Human Resources Policy Development Framework. Paul's here to answer any questions. Andy? Um, thanks very much, Leader. Uh, I, I mean, I understand this is a revision and an update reflecting external changes and, and as things move forward. Just a suggestion, and I'm wondering uh, why it's been written away. Is it 2.7 on Appendix 1? If employees who raise concerns which are proven to be malicious and or vexatious could be dismissed, you know, w should that no, or could that not really be, um, to, could be a subject to disciplinary process which may result in dismissal? 
I, I, it's, it's a wee bit pernickety, but I think it would be happy to make that amendment. I think we've looked at like, the implications that foot facials then go, go down. Okay, can we go to the recommendations? Can we have one? Oh, sorry, Ian. I just the only query is when it is, it's a good report, but the, it, it says that the, at the end that the joint trade unions are, are obviously in agreement with this as well. Did they have any? Did, were they fully involved? I take it from that, and and uh, what kind of comments were they coming back with? Yeah, absolutely. We had some heavy uh, consultation, a number of meetings with the trade unions. Uh, they were all very positive. We wanted their ideas. They wanted to share those ideas. They incorporated a lot of what they said. They compromised where they needed to compromise. And it's been a very positive process from a consultation uh, perspective, not only with the trade unions, but with managers and with staff who've used the policy in the process over the last couple of years. Thanks for that one. Stephen. Thanks, Leader. It was just a quick question on the stage, well, time scales basically. So um, in the appendix from 6.5 onwards, it talks about um, how long it should take for concerns to be acknowledged, etc. the expectation for how long it would take matters to be dealt with or, or escalated if appropriate. Um, is there a way that we can ensure that time scales are kept to and what happens if they're not and what recourse is there for those who are involved in, in, um, in the process? The uh, information about the timescales was something that trade unions were very keen on having put into the procedure. Uh, and we were comfortable with that, particularly after including managers in the consultation process about what was reasonable, what was achievable. Uh, we've also gone beyond that, and what we're going to do is set up a, a central uh, repository of information that uh, OD and HR have an awareness of the types of investigations and fair treatment at work complaints that are ongoing within the council. Uh, and we will take an overview of that and we will make contact with services to offer any support that we can to make sure that they progress within a reasonable timeline. Okay, can we go to the recommendations? Yeah. Uh, just, quickly, so Ugo, uh, sorry, uh, just quickly, when will that include grievance processes as well then? We have... St yeah, the, the central register will initially be set up for uh, the fair treatment at work, but what we're doing is we're looking to extend it to other policies. Uh, we, we have a policy development framework, and the grievance policy is one of those we'll look at in the near future. Thanks. Just on that point about uh, employees, uh, my experience, every employee was given a copy of the timescales of, of, of the policy. But this person, and I understand that trade unions have got a full set of it as well, and so getting that from them. Is it your plan then to give all employees sight of this, saying this is a new policy, this is where you fit into it, because that helps them. It also helps the union guys that just maybe have to deal with an issue. And on, on a final thing, I wish they applied to members as well. But In terms of the communication to the, the wider body of staff, uh, as part of the implementation of the revised policy, we're developing a communications plan. Uh, it's, it's a positive policy. It helps um, to uh, have discussions in the workplace and resolve conflict earlier. Uh, we want to make sure that that is uh, sent out to everybody so that they have that awareness that that's there. And the trade unions, like us, will be making that known to their members as well. Willie? Yes, yeah, it's really uh, just been brought to my attention and being uh, I spoke to Archie about it, Archie Driver. I mean, it's found engaging. Uh, agency workers and agency workers have been employed for more than 12 weeks indeed some may have been employed for nearly two years they don't appear to be getting the same terms and conditions so there is legislation that was again uh, just came to my attention in terms of uh, uh, an agency worker working more than 12 weeks are we applying the same uh, terms and conditions to agency workers as we would to all other employees of the council, direct employees, and if not, can we make sure that we do apply? And that's not just on fully international, it's on other terms and conditions uh, that apply in terms of how we treat our employees. 
policies are written uh, on the basis that uh, we classify our employees uh, and the legal definition of an employee and, and an agency worker is separate from that. Uh, the agency worker uh, will work to the rules of the agency um, in terms of the disciplinary uh, or grievance procedures. Our specific policies are employee focused only. We're always looking at ways in which we can improve the coverage, uh, but the one area that we haven't uh, needed to look at is the agency worker for our particular policies that deal with grievance, disciplinary, or fair treatment at work. Yeah. Oh, sorry. One back. Yeah. Can we maybe uh, at some point in time, because you know, uh, my understanding of what the, the direct legislation in terms of uh, the, the council engaging uh, agency workers over you know, a twelve-week period and longer that does impact on, on terms of how they are recognised at the place of work. Could we perhaps have a, you know some indication here of how we are? Dealing with, with, with people like that, or a further report on it. Leader, happy to do that. Thank you. Okay, John, last one. Now. Yeah, thanks very much, Leader. Just looking at the fair treatment at work policy, 3.2 of the actual policy relates to non council staff and or visitors to the organisation including contractors, volunteers, or agency workers, must also be classed as employees. So that just stays with the policy. Yeah, beg your pardon. That is true, and that is correct. Uh, we have included them as those. There's no regulation or legislation requires to do that, but within the scope of the policy, we've done that. Okay, can we go to the recommendations? Can we approve one and uh, agree two? Thank you. Item 14, I have no other urgent business. Moving on to item 15, can we consider adoption of the resolution to exclude the public from the meeting in terms of section 50A4 and paragraph 9 of part 1 of schedule 7A to the Local Government Scotland Act 1973. Do we agree to adopt the resolution? I just, I, listen, it just comes, slips off the tongue. Yeah, thank you. 